Good morning. Welcome. So yeah, as Mark mentioned, it's my job to kind of set the stage for the remainder of the talks that you'll be hearing this morning and this afternoon and talk about the study design and our site selection and the, um, where, where we ended up selecting sites and the blocking of those sites and the statistical analysis that applies to the remainder of the talks throughout the day so that each presenter doesn't have to repeat that information every single time and use up valuable time that they could otherwise be using to be conveying important results to you folks. So here we go. Is there a pointer out of curiosity? Yes? On this thing? Oh. Thank you. Thanks. There's a pointer. <laughs> okay, so I would be remiss if I didn't start out right away with really conveying to all of you the incredible amount of collaboration that went into both developing this study as well as implementation and then finally analysis and writing of a final report that should be unveiled hopefully relatively soon compared to how long we've been actually conducting the research. Um, the folks listed here are the folks who have been the primary instigators for this work in terms of collecting the data, analyzing the data, and report writing and analyses. There are innumerable other people that have been involved in this study in lots of other ways. Um, most, oops. Red button. Most of these people you will hear from today or have heard from already, like Tim Quinn. But the main players are Department of Ecology, uh, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Washington State University, and Weyerhaeuser. And I would also be remiss if I didn't convey to you the, the number of landowners who have been generous enough to allow us to access sites located on their lands. Starting as early as 2004 and continuing through the present day, we've been going to these same sites, collecting data, and these landowners have been generous enough to allow us to do that. So I would like to um, highlight Fruit Growers Supply Company, Gifford Pinchot National Forest, Green Crow, Hancock Forest Management, Longview Timber, Olympic National Forest, Rainier, the Nature Conservancy, Washington Department of Natural Resources, and Weyerhaeuser. Now, some of these landowners have um, changed names throughout the course of the 10 years since we started doing this study, and some of the sites actually changed landowners as we were conducting the study. And so all of the landowners here aren't currently holders of land that the sites are located on, but they've all been holders of the land at some point during the past 10 years. That's been a challenge for sure, is keeping track of that kind of evolution through time. So Tim already mentioned what the resource goals of the forest practices rules are, but I'll mention them again here because they were really a driving force for the development of our study. And that was to comply with the Endangered Species Act for aquatic and riparian dependent species to restore and maintain riparian habitat to support a harvestable supply of fish, to meet the requirements of the Clean Water Act, and to maintain econo economically viable timber industry. So our specific study objectives were to evaluate the effectiveness of the riparian buffer prescription on non-fish-bearing streams. And prior to the new rules going into place, um, there, there was no special protections afforded for non-fish bearing streams. So this was really a, a big step, was designing protections specifically for non-fish bearing streams. And in particular, we wanted to evaluate the impact of the current forest practices rules on riparian stand characteristics, water quality, primary production, amphibian occupancy, density, and genetics, exports to fish bearing streams, and the response of fish in the downstream fish bearing reach. And you will be hearing talks um, conveying the results for all of these with the exception of the amphibian genetics today. And amphibian genetics results were presented in a at a previous SEMER science conference. So we started um, actually on the ground implementation of this study in 2004. As Tim mentioned, 
thinking about this study started way before that, like six years previous, and the development of the study protocol took several years to put into place. But starting in 2004, we hit the ground contacting landowners and trying to get them on board to see if they would be willing to allow us that access that I was talking about. And, and as you can see, that was quite a large commitment from those landowners to allow us access over a, such a long period of time. And it also required that some of those landowners be willing to implement um, riparian buffer treatments the way that we requested them to do so. So it wasn't just according to forest practices rules or according to their own rules, but um, these different treatments that we were asking them to apply. So that process took um, approximately two years to actually select the sites for the study. And um, I will talk a little bit more about what that site selection entailed in a few minutes. But starting in 2006 was the beginning of our pre-treatment data collection, and we collected two or three years of pre-treatment or pre-harvest data at, across all of our study sites, and um, it depended on what the response variable was, whether that was two or three years. Then starting in 2008, we had about a year-long period where the application of treatments was applied. This was a harvest treatment that I will explain in a minute. And then starting in 2009 through 2011, there was two years of post-treatment data collection. And so these are the data that you're going to be hearing from the other authors on in terms of what our current results are. But for some variables, we've continued to collect data through time and have actually not stopped collecting some data to the current date. So as I mentioned, the site selection took approximately two years, and it was a pretty involved process. It was a f basically a four-step process, starting with the GIS screening. And um, first, I'm just going to tell you what the steps were, and then I will t go into more detail in the following slides. But we started with the GIS screening exercise. We followed that up with collecting data from the landowners themselves. And then there was a field verification of both the landowner and the GIS data on the ground. And then a final selection of sites and a grouping of those sites into blocks. So as Tim mentioned, there was a, a long discussion period of identifying riparian dependent species that should be considered under the forest and fish rules. And stream associated amphibians were highlighted as one of those riparian dependent species. And the seven species that were selected for coverage under forest and fish included three species of torrent salamanders, Columbia, Cascade, and Olympic, two species of tailed frogs, the coastal and the Rocky Mountain tailed frog. This species was actually um, originally just a single species and then was split into two after the rules went into place. And then two species of plethodonid or lungless salamanders, the duns and the van dykes. And for the purpose of our research, we focused on these focal species, the three species of the torrent salamander and the coastal tailed frog. And so these amphibians, the response of these amphibians to the harvest and the alternative riparian buffer treatments is one of the driving factors for um, site selection. So it's really important to realize that we knew we were interested in the response of those amphibians as one of our responses to harvest. And so we wanted to be sure we selected sites at which those amphibians occurred. OK, so the site selection, the GIS screening, um, we selected all non-fish bearing basins. So this is a GIS mapping exercise on the computer, right? So we're selecting all these non-fish bearing basins. That's because we're interested in the rules as they apply to non-fish bearing streams. We selected a basin size between 30 and 120 acres. And that was basically um, the lower limit was identified by the landowners who had agreed to participate. And that lower limit was the, the smallest size that the landowners indicated they would be willing to clear cut harvest basically like it's not common to clear cut harvest smaller areas than 30 acres and then the upper limit the 120 acres was set by the rules themselves so that's the upper limit that can have a continuous harvest without an independent review the physio and then the remainder of these um, criteria 
were based off of the fact that we were including amphibians as a response variable. And so the amphibians of interest are restricted to the west side. So that's how we ended up with these three physiographic regions. And then the elevation, stream gradient, lithology type, and stream order are all based off of what we know about those stream-associated amphibians and where we find them on the landscape. So we were trying to get ourselves to a place where we knew we would be finding the amphibians at the sites. So once we created, we ran through this um, selection of non-fish bearing basins through the GIS exercise, we provided these polygon layers to the landowners who then mapped the non-fish bearing basins that had been selected on their landowner maps. And then they would either um, screen those independently and get back to us if any of the sites met our landowner criteria or allow us to screen those by providing us with the information to do so. And we were looking for non-fish bearing basins that had a stand age um, and distribution greater than 70% of the basin falling between 30 and 80 years old. And we wanted to be sure that the proportion of a single basin was, was at least 80% owned by a single owner. And that's because we wanted to apply our harvest treatments to an entire non-fish bearing basin or a large portion of the non-fish bearing basin and coordinating between multiple landowners to apply those harvest treatments could potentially be fairly difficult. And then for sites that would be selected for harvest treatments, we wanted those sites, we wanted the landowners to be willing to harvest those sites between April of 2008 and March of 2009 in a one year period. So once the, we went through the GIS exercise and landowners helped us select sites that met the, the landowner criteria and the harvest timing criteria, we had a subset of sites that we then went on the ground and verified field information. So we went to hundreds of sites and looked to see if we could actually find those stream-associated amphibians, so the, the tailed frog, the three species of torrent salamanders, and the giant salamanders. If we could find them, then they remain in the pool of potential sites to select from. If we can't find them, then that site is no longer considered for inclusion in the final study. During this time, we also verified the fish, the fish non-fish break or the fish end point. And uh, we did that with electro fishing. And so there was a modeled fish break that was in the GIS that we were basing our site selection criteria on, but that modeled point had not always been verified in the field. So we go out in the field, we verify that point, and many times it's not where it was modeled to be. So the, the point could move upstream or it could move downstream. And we did find that in some instances, when it moved upstream, the basin size no, no longer met that 30 acre minimum criteria. And sometimes when it moved downstream, the basin size became so large that it no longer met the 120 acre maximum criteria. And sometimes um, included an additional tributary that really blew up the size of that basin. And so those sites could also no longer be considered for inclusion. And in addition to verifying amphibian presence in the fish end point, we were also verifying the stand age criteria. Sometimes the, um, the landowner's stand age information was just ever so slightly outdated and we'd get out there and find out that part of, our, part of that basin had recently been clear cut, for example. So then that could no longer be included in our study. We were also looking for a minimum of 75 meters between the true fish end point, wherever we verified that to be with the electrofishing, and the next downstream tributary junction. And that was to allow for the um, response of the fish in the downstream fish bearing portion. So in the end, we had 17 study sites that were first, second, and third order streams located on perennial non-fish bearing streams in managed second growth forests. They were predominantly Douglas fir and western hemlock, and they were located on private state and federal timberlands. The stand age, again, was between 30 and 80 years old. And we allowed for a little bit of flexibility with our minimum and maximum um, acre basin criteria and when actually ended up going up to 
133 acres as the largest basin size instead of the 120 that was our original criteria. And so in these 17 study sites, we applied one of four experimental treatments. So we had um, some study sites that remained unharvested throughout the period of our data collection. So these are still on managed lands with stand ages between 30 and 80 years, but there's no harvest occurring at these sites while we're conducting our study. Then we have one application of the forest practices rule, which uh, Tim described a little bit, but basically it's 50%, at least 50% of this non-fish bearing stream length protected by a two-sided 50-foot buffer. And the, the precise application of that is that there's this minimum required packed buffer immediately upstream of the fish end point. And then there were buffers along those sensitive sites that Tim discussed, and in this picture, those sensitive sites are the tributary junctions and the head walls. And then we wanted to compare this current forest practices rule to greater protection, and so we chose to select the greatest amount of protection that could be afforded, and that would be to buffer the entire non-fish bearing stream length. And then we wanted to compare that to lesser protection, and we chose the other extreme so that is none of the non-fish bearing stream length buffered by that same two-sided 50-foot riparian buffer. All of these still have the 30-foot equipment exclusion zone. So equipment can't go, you can't like drive across the stream, basically. <laughs> Three minutes, oh boy. Okay. <laughs> so harvest timing, um, this is just to give you a quick look here. Most of the harvests did occur within the, that 12 12-month window that we were hoping it would occur in with three exceptions, two extended, one additional month, and then one harvest did occur completely outside of the window, but just by a few months. We are actually pretty pleased with that outcome. This is the way this looks on the ground. So here are four of our sites, reference 100% forest practices and 0% aerial photos prior to harvest, and then here's after harvest, how that looks on the ground. So our sites are distributed between those different physiographic regions. One block of sites in the Olympics, three in the Willapas, and one in the South Cascades. And then we have um, the references, 100% forest practices, and zero here. So you can see we only have two complete blocks with all four of the treatments applied. We had, this was intended to be another complete block here but one of the sites ended up not being harvested. If you remember, this was when the economy like, totally tanked, and so some landowners weren't able to follow through with their commitment, and so we kept this as an additional reference. This block was always just two, two sites, and then this one was originally four as well, and then here we lost this site because the landowner applied part of the treatment, and then the economy tanked, and they couldn't complete the treatment application, and so we lost that site from the study. And this is the distribution of those sites. So here are the two complete blocks, one in the Olympics and this Willapa one is two complete blocks with one each of the four different treatments. And so here are all the variables that we measured as well as who measured them. So this is how all of those different players that I introduced in the beginning fit in. Um, Eco Department of Ecology largely was involved with collecting water and air temperature and then downstream and export data. Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission did the vegetation and also large woody debris input. Um, Department of Fish and Wildlife was stream channel morphology, large woody debris, paraphyte and standing crop, or a measure of primary productivity, and then the amphibian presence and abundance. And Washington State University did the amphibian genetics. And then finally, Weyerhaeuser did the responsive fish downstream. So you'll be hearing more about all of these again throughout the day here with the exception of this genetics piece. So the data analysis was a before after control impact study where we collected pre and post harvest treatment at the same sites and then are able to compare the data at those sites before and after harvest to give us that harvest effect. And then the reference versus treatment comparison controls for an environmental confound. There are many unanticipated disturbances that occur throughout the Pacific Northwest. Here's an example of some of them, and I would um, 
like to share with you the fact that one of these did impact several of our study sites in 2007, that huge um, storm of December 2007, blew down uh, trees and a lot of our study sites. And so we did two different evaluations. One was an on-site evaluation and one was with aerial photography to evaluate how the extent of the blowdown at our study sites so that we could consider that in our data analysis. And the results were consistent across the two methods, thankfully. And what we found was that um, all sites were impacted to some extent, but that some sites were impacted to a much greater extent. And luckily, those sites generally occurred in the same blocks. So our three most impacted sites were all in the same study block, that Willapa 1 block. And so that, that means that with the blocking factor in our analysis will help um, control for the variability that that wind throw introduced into our study. We also added another year of pretreatment sampling because of that so that our pretreatment data truly reflected the range of conditions prior to treatments. So today's presentations, this is what you're going to see. Again, responses on all of those different variables. And there will also be two panel discussions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And it's during that time that you can really ask the authors questions about their results. And that's all I have to say today for now. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>